Welcome to Clinical Conversations, COVID-19, the Sleep Medicine Perspective. This is a product of the AASM Sleep and Public Safety Committee with Indira Gavatala, MD, as the chair and Shannon Sullivan as vice chair. I'm your guest host today, Seema Kosla. I'm medical director of the North Dakota Center for Sleep here in sunny Fargo, North Dakota. I have with me Dr. Chris Winter. He is the owner of Charlottesville Neurology and Sleep Medicine, and of course, he is the author of The Sleep Solution, Why Your Sleep is Broken and How to Fix It. Welcome, Dr. Winter. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, you can call me Chris if you like, but if you feel like it should be formal and I should be Dr. Winter, then that's, that's okay too. That sounds lovely. Well, let's dive right in. You're on the East Coast. Can you tell us how COVID-19 has impacted your practice? It's impacted it pretty significantly and, and, and rapidly. Um, this time of year, I, I work with a lot of professional sports teams. So this time every year, I abandon my family and go to Florida and Arizona and hang out with a bunch of guys in uniforms figuring out how to bunt to baseball. And it's a lot of fun and we talk about sleep and how to help them with their sleep and whatnot. So I got back from that trip I think on March 11th and kind of felt like things were starting to get a little interesting and, and um, with the flights I was taking and more and more masks popping up. Um, and then I saw patients for a couple of days and then was sort of looking at some of the writing on the wall and said, you know, I think that we really need to consider, um, you know, closing the practice, uh, doing telemedicine, and then just every day something would happen. You know, the next day the hospital would put out, you know, the parent hospital puts out a big announcement. Now we're independent, so we could kind of make our own decisions, but we were following what other bigger hospital systems were doing. Suddenly, you know, restrictions and telemedicine waivers came about. So we pretty quickly transitioned from myself as a provider, my full-time nurse practitioner's provider, two full-time office staff, a transcriptionist, an accountant, to doing it all completely telemedicine. Um, so it's impacted us pretty significantly. Um, so that's sort of the nuts and bolts of the practice. Then we wanted to look, you know, kind of looking at do people come, you know, when they are sequestered in their house, when money is tight? And we really haven't seen any dip whatsoever in terms of demand for our services. Um, and we saw the same thing back in the big uh, uh, economic collapse we had several years ago where we thought, wow, everybody will cut sleep out because you, you'll pay attention to the blood coming out of your ear. But if you, you know, having trouble sleeping, you'll probably not go to that office visit. And again, then it was very much the opposite. We were flooded with people. Like they would ignore the blood coming out of the ear, but the stress of the situation, the stress of finances and jobs and family and health really drove people to our clinic. So it's impacted, I would say, the way we provide, but not what we're providing. And I will note that the hospital sleep centers around here have been shut down, although we are continuing to do home studies, but doing it in a very careful way. That's really interesting perspective. I love that story of seeing more masks pop up on the airplanes. <laughs> there was, yeah, it was every, I mean, so I was going back and forth and I went to New York at one point, Philly at one point and um, uh, some other city there. And it was, it was really interesting that with every subsequent flight, the, the, the masks were taking over the non-masks um, for sure. So I wonder if you can help us with this a little bit and tell us about the risk of coronavirus transmission from PAP and about the original uh, data from Toronto's with their SARS uh, information. Yeah, I, I think that, and, th and this rapidly evolved very quickly too. So we got back and we almost immediately started getting calls um, and information or calls and uh, queries about um, Hey, I wear a CPAP. Is this something safe for me to do? Uh, particularly if I live with other people. Um, 
you know, in the house. And, you know, it started off with, um, well, you know, are you uh, COVID positive? Are people in the house COVID positive? Are people at risk? And then every day, you know, we were putting together a little flow chart trying to kind of get people to ask certain basic questions, you know, and then whether, you know, what the, the, the risk and benefit was of their wearing their CPAP. And literally every day we get some input on the flow chart. Oh, you should tweak it to say this or do that or change the colors or, you know, whatever, make this error go there or that. And every day something would come out. And so by the time we were done, we went from, you know, really caring about what somebody's COVID status was, um, uh, and, and, you know, uh, are you positive? You know, are you showing symptoms of it? To basically by the end of it, we literally just got rid of um, all of that. And everybody was sort of determined to be presumably infected and should be treated that way. So to answer your question, I, I think that there probably is some risk of the device potentially aerosolizing uh, the virus. Um so, you know, we've been telling patients, look, you know, if you feel comfortable not wearing the device, you've got an AHI of seven and you mainly do it because it keeps you from snoring um, for your partner, you could consider not using it or maybe using something like an oral appliance. So I was just talking to Dr. Remmers a couple of days ago about, wow, what a great time for oral appliances for the treatment of sleep apnea. Uh, potentially. Um, but if you really need the device, you may want to consider being in a room by yourself um, so that, you know, if it is potentially aerosolizing this, 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 this virus, that at least you're containing it, you know, to one room of the house. Now, if you've got some sort of central air system or whatnot, that might not be as, as helpful as possible. But, but, you know, that's what we've been saying lately. In terms of the Toronto SARS data, um, uh, you, know, it, you know, thinking back back to the 2003 outbreak, um, you know, I think we, we, we learned a lot about, you know, the way we should manage these patients and perhaps um, uh, ways in which to kind of handle group populations. You know, to me, I, I think that the CPAP lessons are all kind of the same, um, uh, regardless of the infectious agent. You know, the one thing I would say about COVID is that it seems like afterwards, there are a lot of long-term medical issues that people who recover from SARS might be dealing with. And, you know, looking at things like narcolepsy um, and some of the data that came out of, you know, California a few years ago that, hey, during this particular flu or flu vaccine season, there was a big spike in incidence of narcolepsy. I, I would wonder if perhaps some of these bigger outbreaks um, could potentially lead to other forms of sleep problems that we may not see for, you know, several months or even years down the line. That's fascinating. And so I think it's really interesting that we're having to pull this information from healthcare workers who are infected from patients. So to me, that seems very linear, right? You have a sick patient and you do something with their airway, you intubate them or do high flow oxygen or you do non-invasive, right? And then healthcare workers are getting sick. And now we're having to extrapolate that to our patients at home and, and really provide them with guidance. So along those same lines, what do you tell your asymptomatic CPAP patients who might be carriers? So you had alluded to this before, somebody who's perhaps mild, and maybe the recommendation is, you know, consider an oral appliance or maybe go without for a little while. Uh, are you doing anything different to patients who are new to CPAP? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, and, and not to sound like a, you know, a CNN talking head, um, it really sort of is boiling down to testing now, isn't it? Because, you know, the patient sitting in your office or on the telemedicine, you know, call with you is either, has either never been exposed to it, had it, didn't know they had it, is now recovered, um, or, um, you know, potentially, you know, is, 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 is in the midst of an infection and, and doesn't know it, you know, so are these people, you know, developing some sort of immunity? We don't really know. So the people who are new to CPAP, you know, we really are just having a lot more of a conversation now prior to starting people on any therapy 
about this? I mean, it's sort of the new world we're in right now. We all talk about, well, do you like a nasal pillow? Do you think you like the full face? Do you think a CPAP would work for you? Or do you think maybe an oral appliance or, you know, some sort of procedure or the, you know, the, an implantable device? You know, we, ha we, we all have those conversations in different ways and they're fairly rote in our clinics. Now, you know, we are asking more questions about, you know, who lives with you? And so that's the bit, you know, if you live by yourself, that might be a completely different conversation than if you, you know, are living with a relatively large family, if you live with your parents and you're taking care of them, you know, so it's an interesting point you make about, you know, the healthcare worker and, and maybe, and I know they're using more and more CPAP devices and trying to move away from, you know, mechanical ventilation because these patients don't seem to do well once they get on the ventilator. So, you know, being in a hospital situation where a CPAP could literally shoot it out to many different people who are going to be in contact with others, if you're truly socially isolating, you know, your risk might be much smaller. So that's the other conversation we're having with people is, look, how seriously are you taking this? Um, you know, do you kind of casually mingle with some neighbors or you're going into the office or you're a, you're a worker who has to work in some sort of profession because it's deemed essential. So, I mean, all of these questions are completely new in our clinics and things we were never talking about before. And I'll, I suspect they're not going to end anytime soon. So these may be longer questions. In fact, a patient just brought me another yesterday or showed me a picture of a filter that goes on your CPAP, you know, on the tube. It's like a little disc filter like you'd see in the hospital. So they're selling them now for people CPAP devices. So, you know, we're having to answer a lot of questions without a lot of data right now. It seems to be a theme. I agree with you. Isn't it funny, though, to see how innovative people are? Absolutely. No, and I've always felt like sleep patients are incredibly innovative. You know, if the tube gets in your way, you suddenly get this massive, you know, cantilevered pulley system hooked to your ceiling that some some woman has built and it holds the hose and no matter where she moves, it keeps it off of her body, you know, or taking stocks and insulating your CPAP tube. So people come up with solutions. So I, mean, I think that there's always been this kind of fear of getting sick from a CPAP device, whether, you know, real or completely unfounded. And do I need to get the device that cleans my CPAP? Because on the commercial, it really looks like it could make me sick. And so I, mean, I think people have always been a little bit concerned about it. Plus a CPAP to a lay person kind of looks like a ventilator. So I imagine there's a lot of confusion and a lot of anxiety about that device sitting on your bedside table. I think you're exactly right. So then, as you pointed out, we are asking these new questions that we're really not used to asking, are we? So let's say your patient does have a, a known contact or, or somebody who's felt to be high risk. Do you wait for them to have symptoms or do you just tell them, you know what, hang on, you know, self-quarantine or stop your PAP? What advice are you offering those patients? Yeah, so and I guess you could look at this two ways. Um, you are an elderly person on a CPAP device. You've got a young uh, young person in the home who uh, potentially you know, is sick, is, is showing signs of coughing and fever. So that person could be a high risk contact. It could be vice versa too, that the, the younger person who's on the CPAP is living with um, an older person and, and, and they're the ones showing signs of it. So, you know, we've not really told people at this point to hold off on the PAP, but it is part of the dialogue. Um, you know, even as, as, in as much as, listen, hey, I'm on this telemedicine visit with you. Here's your sleep study. I'm going to show, hold it up to my web camera, and you can see you stop breathing 38 times an hour, and we talk about what that means. Okay, great. I think you need a CPAP device. You know, that does mean leaving your house and going to a home care company um, you know, that sells ventilators and hospital beds and nebulizers and, and sick people are probably going in there all the time. You know, how comfortable do you feel even going to get set up on your CPAP device? So I think that that's a big part of the initial 
the initial part of it that if you're in a high risk situation, I don't want you exposing the people at the home care company. I don't want you unnecessarily exposing yourself to the people at the home care company and, and, and what, what they're doing. So, you know, I, I think that it's kind of a person to person basis. If you've got somebody with really significant sleep apnea and there's compelling reasons to have them on that CPAP, you know, I would probably bite the bullet and have them move forward with it as long as they felt comfortable with it. You know, if this is the kind of person who's probably had this, you know, moderate sleep apnea for the last 10 years, you know, holding off another few weeks, as long as it, you know, the patient understands what, what, what you're, what you're proposing, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world either. And I think regardless of the situation with the CPAP, um, you know, they should definitely be sort of self-quarantined, particularly if they decide to use the CPAP and now they're a high-risk individual potentially blasting COVID all over their bedroom. So how have your patients reacted to this news when you say, you know what, you maybe should consider you know, if you can't self-isolate, maybe you need to take a break from your CPAP. Do you have patients that fight you on this and they're, they're really reluctant? Are they dismissive of your advice? I wouldn't say they're dismissive, but I think that if we're doing our jobs properly, that people should be fairly reluctant to give up their CPAPs. You know, I don't have to tell the audience that's listening to this, you know, sleep, when somebody at church tells you they have sleep, sleep apnea, they could have six breathing problems per hour. They could have 60. They could have 160, theoretically. So when somebody says sleep apnea, there is a wide range of individuals. Now, you know, I think most doctors are kind of looking at that six, HI of six, and really having a more in-depth discussion rather than, oh, you've got sleep apnea, you must be on a CPAP. So I think most pay our clinic you know, we tell them, look, we're going to ask you to put a vacuum cleaner on your face for the rest of your life. And obviously it's blowing, not suck. You make a leaf blower on your face for the rest of your life. You know, so there should be some significant benefit to it, you know, for you to, you know, I don't, I'm not wearing the glasses on my face right now because I like the way they look. I can't see without them. So I will give up the inconvenience of having to wear them for the benefit of them. So patients, generally speaking, are quite reluctant to give it up. I mean, I've got patients that when the power goes out, even though I've told them a million times, it's you're going to be okay if the power's out one night. They will pack up their CPAP and check into a hotel because they refuse to sleep, even take a nap without it. So I think those people are very reluctant to give it up. So you're going to have to use your sort of clinical radar. And if you start going down the pathway, so Mr. Smith, you know, you know, how are you feeling? How's the COVID? You know, how are you working? Are you working from home? Are you out of work? How are your finances? I mean, I think it's important that we start all of our conversations off that way these days because people have a lot of anxieties and it's comforting for them to talk to a to a to a doctor even if they're like me not a not a, not a real doctor you know, like i'm a sleep doctor not you know it's like my wife says if you're out in the woods and you break your leg with me you're you're really in trouble um so you know but i think it's important for us to have these conversations with people um but i don't find a lot of people if they've committed to using the device you know and they've gone more than a few months with it they're probably in it for the long haul so I would say that in my experience, most of them are reluctant to give it up. Now, they can be open to, you know, sort of an oral appliance or, hey, what do you think about the next week? Just, you know, propping a couple extra pillows up in your bed and sleeping more upright and maybe not having your wine with dinner and seeing how things go. I mean, they'll talk to you about it, but most of them really, really want their CPAP. And if they're doing a good job of socially isolating and they're just with their spouse or maybe just with their spouse and children and, you know, can we convince them to go down the basement and sleep down there for a little while? They're usually pretty, pretty open to those kinds of suggestions. You know, you're much nicer. I usually say air compressor strapped to your head. So maybe I should maybe I should adopt your verbiage. That's right. That's right. I remember I had a, a doctor I won't name in, in training would would say, "Oh, you don't want to wear a CPAP," and he kept this little framed picture of a guy with a trach, and it was not a pretty trach. And he's like, "Well, we could just do this." And you know, I mean, I just thought it was so mean that he would do that to people, but it certainly affected their motivation very quickly to want to wear the CPAP. That's true. Trach is something you pull out every so often. Exactly. That's every right. So That's often. right. That's you right. Sprinkle it in there. <laughs> That's right. So then if you have made that recommendation that they discontinue their PAP therapy, at what point do you think you will reevaluate things? Yeah, I mean, 
in the times that we've done this or a patient has voluntarily said they'd like to suspend their use, I mean, I, part of the nice thing, I, I, I didn't think I'd like telemedicine as much as I do. I, was, I wouldn't say I was against it, but I do feel like losing that sort of in-person connection is important. You're reading body language and whatnot, but you know, it's actually been kind of pleasantly interesting. I've got a lot of thoughts about telemedicine that I never thought I would have had. Uh, and it does make things to me a little more easy for just the quick, the quick pop in, you know, I mean, if I had to have a patient drive to your office and just talk to you for a couple minutes and drive back is difficult, but this is kind of nice. So the answer to your question, I would do it pretty quickly, at least initially. It's kind of like your narcolepsy patients, you've put on some drugs or whatever. Like I want to follow up with them very quickly. Once they get comfortable with situation, then maybe you can stretch it out a little bit. But I would say for these individuals, we're talking to them probably within, excuse me, within a week um, just to make sure, hey, how are things going? And obviously, you know, it, we say it's perfectly fine. You can call us tomorrow if you have a terrible night tonight. But I definitely want to hear from them within, you know, five to seven days and see how they're feeling without it. Um, and just make sure, you know, maybe more than anything, they know that I'm there and, and supporting them and kind of along the way. Not to mention the fact that I, I'm just still blown away by the way we talk about things today on Friday. You know, this interview, if we did it next Friday, might be really different. I mean, I'm just, I'm just shocked by how rapidly our thinking about things change, the numbers change, the modelings predict or don't predict, you know, doctors are learning all kinds of things about it as they go, you know, so, I mean, it's really a fascinating time of watching how the medical community responds in a crisis of this magnitude, both in terms of being able to learn on the fly, but also put that message out to patients that, hey, we thought maybe you should be doing this last week, but now we really think this is probably the better thing to do. So I would, I, I would say fairly, fairly uh, quickly after they discontinued it and with relatively quick frequency, uh, 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 rapid frequency as long as the patients you know are not saying hey listen I, I feel perfectly fine off the device I've gone periods without it I'm okay you know but I, I think you know making people feel supported because I think for a lot of people they really feel like they're breathing their respiration their lives kind of depend on it um, and they don't like to be without it so we want to kind of make sure they feel like they're, they're they've got a team behind them. I love how you bring up a Seinfeld reference to make telemedicine reference to make it really <laughs> relevant <laughs> again. <laughs> so let's shift a little bit. You know, you'd mentioned some of the concerns that people are voicing the economic concerns, for example. So tell us a little bit about your current policy at your center. Uh, are you doing any in lab testing? Have you shifted completely to home based sleep apnea testing? Are you using disposables? That's interesting. Yep. So so our situation is this, um, the sleep center, so in Charlottesville, Virginia, there's the University of Virginia, and then there's Martha Jefferson or Sintera. Uh, so that's the university hospital and then the community hospital. So I started the sleep center at the community hospital back in 2003 and was its medical director up until about two years ago. Um, so I still read my sleep studies through there, um, but have no sort of administrative role there. In my private clinic, uh, which, I, which I still have, uh, we do home studies through there as well too. So pre-COVID, you could come to Charlottesville um, and you could get a sleep, an in-lab sleep study through Martha Jefferson. Um, you could get a home study through Martha Jefferson and you could get a home study through our office. And it works really well. And certain insurances like it when you go through the home care, the, the, the parent hospital, others like it when you go through the clinic, et cetera. So um, plenty to go around and everybody was busy and, and, and labs were full. When this started, um, we decided to continue doing the um, home testing. So what we were doing is we were obviously sterilizing the equipment, 
a lot of it, the cannula underneath your nose and whatnot is, is disposable. Um, and then what we would do is we would sterilize the incoming piece of equipment and it would stay in a sealed room after it was sterilized for an additional 24 hours before it went out again. Um, the parent hospital decided to suspend all testing and there was a real fight for the hospital based sleep doctors to continue home home testing I and mean, obviously for the techs too because if there's no home testing and in lab testing they're laid off so the plan was we will walk the sterilized home device out to the parking lot the patient will drive up we will hand it to them and we will pick it up from them the exact same way the next day which i thought sounded very safe and very reasonable um uh, particularly for people who, who really need the sleep study but the hospital decided not to do that so that's the situation as it is today, uh, the 17th of April. Um, in terms of the completely disposables, um, we have looked at that. We were actually looking at that prior to COVID, and that's a whole other interesting topic of, you know, looking at it that's really interesting, and, and maybe you could even get some EEG data in there, which is a neurologist I love. But if you're actually looking at the, the dollars and cents of it, you know, to be honest, some of these home care, uh, these um, sleep apnea, CPAP companies essentially give away their home testing kits uh, because of probably what they're getting on the back end. You know, if Chris does a lot of sleep studies, we'll sell a lot of ResMed, you know, devices or whatnot, even though we're not beholden to any one company. And it's sort of like, we'll give you the glucometer because we'll make our money on the test strips kind of thing. So I think that the completely disposable uh, systems that we looked at were really interesting and, and seemed to do a really great job. But, you know, how much am I going to pay per patient and what can I get from a reimbursement perspective? You know, it's kind of like actigraphy and a lot of things we wish we could do in our clinic. It just doesn't make sense. Do I necessarily want to pay more for something that seems to be working okay right now? Not that I'm a you know, tremendous fan of all home sleep testing. So it's what's interesting now is with the COVID situation, um, they've got a different, you know, variable they bring to the picture. Hey, you can give this to your, your, your uh, patient and it's much safer than something that you have to clean or sterilize. So right now we're not, but I do think that um, this is going to provide a very unique opportunity for certain home testing um, devices that um, would be, uh, you know, I don't know, more, more COVID friendly um, or at least have the appearance, you know, maybe it's you know, never been shown to be any, you know, uh, more safe than the devices we're currently using for home studies, but the appearance of, oh, I can just throw the whole thing away um, might really sell it for some people. So I thought your comment about telemedicine was really interesting that you had some thoughts about telemedicine that you never thought you would have. And that surprises oh, me a little bit. Look at that. So at one point you had tweeted, I follow you on Twitter, by the way, uh, and you tweeted that you are now seeing 100% of your patients via telemedicine. How's that going for you? It is, it is, it's going well. Um, you know, I, I desperately miss my staff. Um, so we have one person in the office, um, my, our office manager, and she is a superstar. And so she just is there. I assume she's there. I can't, there's no way for me to prove she's there. Uh, but I assume she's there answering phone calls, making appointments. So from the outside, I'm not sure that the average new patient would know anything is different, you know, obviously until they have the telemedicine visit. And so we go in at certain times in the evening, one, one, one at a time to drop off, you know, dictaphones and charts and, and sign prescriptions and things of that nature. Um, so, I, you know, I thought logistically it would be a nightmare. Um, and it really wasn't. And that's probably because my staff is so smart. Like I wrote out this whole grand plan and they looked at it and said, yeah, we already figured all this out and more kind of thing. So um, I think it does present problems if you're truly doing a completely everybody's in a different spot kind of clinic that for my office staff to communicate with each other I think is difficult um, you know for me it's not that big of a deal um, so the, the the flow is I go in at night 
drop off what I need to drop off, including order forms and things that I filled out for my patients the following day. I get all the information for my upcoming patients the next day. Um, and then, you know, see my patients uh, via telemedicine and then, you know, kind of repeat the process. So from my perspective, it's been, it's been nice. I had this, uh, and I'll admit it, um, ageist um, sort of bias that, you know, I've seen my my parents struggle with technology, and you know, I just got you know a call yesterday how excited they were to discover Facebook. You know, it's fantastic. You know, in 2020 that you finally figured that out. Um, so you know, there's a lot. I figured there'd be a lot of resistance uh, to us for a certain generation, maybe um, to to want to do that, and it's really been the opposite. You know, the 81 year old woman, man, she is on there. She is in my way my virtual waiting room five minutes early she's got her web camera set up because she's communicating with her friends who she plays bridge with and it's the young people that seem to be kind of all over the place in terms of you know but our no show rate has actually improved um and it's kind of nice i feel like i'm more on time with telemedicine which i I'm shocked that that's the case because you've got a patient right there in your, in your, your, your waiting room and right there in your exam room. Like that puts a lot of pressure on me, but for some reason, you know, the computer seems to organize things a little bit differently, at least for me. Um, and I like the idea that if I am a little bit late, you're not stuck in my waiting room looking at, you know, Rolling Stone magazines and People magazines from a couple months ago that you could put a few dishes away or you could, you know, finish the end of your Breaking Bad episode that you were binge watching or, you know, oh, there's Chris. Oh, hey, what's going on? Like it, it's just, I don't know. And, it, and it's, it's, it's interesting too, that whatever you lose in terms of that face to face, the body language, the ability to do a good neurological exam, I think you definitely gain by seeing people in their natural state. Um, there's something different going on there. It's sort of like what we always said about in-lab studies and home studies that, you know, in-lab's great and you get all kinds of information, but you are in a weird place with somebody watching on a camera with wires taped all over your body. So it's like, isn't it the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? If you observe something, you, you, you by nature change what you're observing. So you can never see something for what it really is if you're looking at it. So, you know, to me, it's, it's kind of nice. And my nurse practitioner, I think, has gotten three tours of people's homes. I've only gotten one, but I think that's, that's a, the, the N is so small that that would not be a significant number. That's funny. I know I've really enjoyed meeting the spouses and the pets Absolutely. and looking at the sleep environment. And, and you know what I never realized that I would love so much? Everybody knows what mask they have. They just go get it and they show That's it to you. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. I and mean, your medications and all kinds of good stuff. No, I, I agree with you hundred percent. That's really funny. So you put this picture out on Twitter and it's a fantastic picture. So I am imagining you doing telemedicine right here. I can. Um, so that's my office. That's my real office. Um, and unfortunately, um, I'll have to send you, I'll, I, will, I will tweet a different picture of my home office where I'm doing my uh, telemedicine now. But no, I, I really like that office a lot. I think most professionals if you if you're fortunate enough to have an office it's, it's a lot of fun to kind of make it your own little space you know I at home you know I'm not really in charge of anything here so I can't you know like, I like this picture you know the the dog's playing poker my wife's like nope that doesn't go anywhere in any house that I will ever live in so you know it's kind of nice to have control over your your office space even though technically my, my wife owns the office so it's actually in her name but I will point out a couple things on this picture on the right there's this beat up little brown bag so that was my great grandfather's grandfather's doctor's bag he was a farmer and because this little rural place where he lived in west virginia had no doctor he said oh well whatever just watch my crop and i'm going to go off and be a doctor so he went off to be a doctor came back and just continued farming but then he took care of the town and he medical problems they had and some relative who I've never met found me online he's through some sort of genealogy thing and said hey I found you and I heard you're a doctor and 
you know, we don't have any doctors that we know of in the family. So they just send it to me. So it's the coolest thing in the world. And, and then if you look around all those little pictures of sports illustrated, I get you know, the, whenever I work with an athlete who says, you know, who's been on the cover of sports illustrated, I always get a copy of the cover and ask if they'd sign it. And I always ask them to sign something sleep related. That's, that's the, the bargain that, you know, so you gotta say, you know, dear Chris, and you gotta write something about your sleep. And my favorite one that, that you can't see in this picture is a football player who wrote thank you for being impossibly gentle last night while we slept and so I thought that was pretty funny uh -oh. that he put that on there so that one is not out there for the public to see but if y'all come to Charlottesville and visit me uh, sometime I'll, I'll show it to you that one's not going to make an appearance on your on your Twitter that page. one's not going to be on the Twitter page no there's a couple <laughs> of them pretty funny I think you've, you've kind of hinted at this one. So if this reimbursement for center to home telemedicine remains in place after this national emergency, will you continue to utilize it? I, I, probably. Um, I, I think so. Um, you know, I can see something being a little bit, um, you kind of split. I don't like the idea of completely being outside of a clinic. I think that, again, my ability to kind of on the fly communicate with my staff, um, to see a patient, to put, you know, my hands on a patient when, you know, when appropriate is, is important. Um, so there's something that does make me a little sad to think that this is the future of medicine that we would look back and think, Oh my God, you know, grandpa, Chris, he was a doctor before he started, you know, seeing people that weren't there. Um, he used to do all their medicine where he would come to an office and see him and you know, all the people would be like, Oh my God, it's crazy. He's so old. Like, I can't, it makes me sad to think that what we're doing now is threatened and is going to be sort of, you know, laughed at, you know, a, a generation or two from now. But I, I, I will say my position on it has softened. And, you know, I've always felt positively about it in terms of getting services to people who don't have access to it in other ways. So, I mean, I live in Virginia, and when we were in residency at the University of Virginia, we'd drive down to, you know, the Appalachia part of that tip of Virginia that kind of borders Kentucky and Tennessee, and, and they just really didn't have access to a lot of great health care. So, you know, I've always felt positively about it, you know, in that way. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that there, there are some, there's definitely some positives there um, that should be explored. And, um, you know, I like it when patients of mine leave and they go off to college or something like that. I always feel bad making them come all the way back just to get, you know, for talk for 20 minutes to get their medications refilled. So I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of up for maybe blending a little bit more of that into what we do. Um, but I think the biggest conversation we have to have is with patients. So it's going to be a very fun debrief, you know, hopefully when this is all over, like, what'd you think of it? And I ask a lot of patients while we're on the call and, you know, I haven't had anybody really complain about it and they seem to really kind of think it's novel and fun. And so we'll see, uh, you know, Maybe you'll um, have a hybrid approach. Maybe you'll physically be yeah, in the office so you can communicate absolutely. with your staff, right? And then the people that you can't, you know, the people that you really do need to bring in, maybe then the next appointment is an in-person appointment. Yeah, or no, something I, I like think that. that's exactly, I think that's exactly right. You know, or somebody who just can't make it. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how insurances, you know, for instance, the face-to-face -face visit 30 to 90 days after you start a CPAP, which is difficult for some people and I've got patients who get their sleep app CPAP and they go on a you know a trip in a Winnebago across the country and now they've got to see me within 30 to 90 days or they can't go down to Florida for their you know hibernation or whatnot so it'll be interesting to see how insurances you know how what their response is do they is, is it going to be like the home sleep study okay from now on we only pay for telemedicine at half the price or you know we'll allow you to do this or we're going to let you keep doing it but we're going to make it stricter in terms of how you bill for it so there's a lot of 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 questions to be answered and probably how i feel about it and other doctors feel about it you know if, if history is in a guide sometimes it's secondary to what what we'll get paid for so i hope we have a voice in it i'm always you know, I was kind of dismayed the way we rolled out home sleep testing that we had this great plan for it as sleep doctors and the insurance was like, yep, well, here's our plan. This is what you're going to do. So even if she's a 20 year old cross country runner who has sleep paralysis and catap 
plexi, we still want you to do an in lab or a home study first, you know, so hopefully we can, we can be a little bit more uh, collegial uh, as we figure out what to do with this as we move past this crisis. Well, that's just it, right? I feel like we're, we're in this acute crisis management. And I think we do need to keep an eye on when we get through this. So have you thought about what your criteria are for when you do reopen your clinic and sleep lab for, for people coming in? What other precautions will you take? What are you changing? And at what point will you decide to pull the trigger and reopen to patients coming in? Yeah, so it's interesting because prior to leaving for my big spring training trip, we were already um, taking all of our patients' temperature. So we bought this cool little Withings uh, thermometer that you just kind of set to somebody's temple. You barely even have to touch them. It's easy to sterilize. And everybody who came in, including ourselves, so that was our joke. We'd walk around and poke each other in the temple throughout the day and, and take our temperatures. And so we were already doing that. We had signage up about if you have any kind of active illness or around people who are, please, we will work with you to reschedule this appointment. Please don't you know, expose people unnecessarily. Um, and by God, we were cleaning the hell out of our clinic. I mean, it, going into it, it smelled like a, you know, like the local pool where you grew up, you know, like that overwhelming smell of, you know, de um, Clorox and, and disinfectant. So, I mean, I think that, you know, when we will open it up, you know, at this point, we're not hurting. Um, so we have the luxury of being able to sort of, you know, take our time, look around and see what other clinics are doing, what, you know, our parent hospital is, what is the University of Virginia doing, what does the Virginia Department of Health recommend. So I suspect that we will be in line with them, if not maybe even a little bit delayed. I do think there's a difference between reopening your clinic and people coming to your clinic. So that's going to be very interesting too, that when we say, okay, you know, everything's, everything's fine now, you can come out and come to our clinic. It'll be interesting to see how people respond to going into a medical facility, even though it's a sleep clinic and it's in a, we're in our own building and it doesn't feel particularly medical, as you can see from that picture of my office. Uh, but I still think people might be reluctant to, you know, I, I, I hated taking my kids to the pediatrician because I just felt like, you know, I'm going to have whooping cough when this appointment's over because everything just seems like, and my kids would want to go, I want to go play with the train set that's sitting there in the waiting room. Oh my God, please do not touch the train set in the pediatrician's waiting room. So I do think we have that kind of preconceived notion sometime um, about, you know, labs and clinics and stuff like that being places where there might be more of a chance of getting infection. The precautions, I think we'll continue to really work hard to go above and beyond with cleaning. Um, we were wearing masks. Um, we happened to have masks, gowns, and gloves, just a little bit, um, just in case of something like this. And so we were wearing the same little N95 mask every day when we were seeing patients. And we said, look, this is probably more for making sure that we're not carrying something to give to you versus you getting us sick. Um, unfortunately, nobody in our clinic did get sick or has, has tested positive, which might not mean anything because nobody's been tested. Um, so I think we'll continue to clean um, very aggressively, um, uh, you know, and, and then, you know, making sure that we're wearing massively for a period of time. And then in sort of the sleep lab, you know, it's not my decision to reopen that. So it'd be really interesting to see, when that happens, you know, sleep testing is kind of in this weird category of it's not elective. I mean, we're not taking bunions off people's feet, but it's not a, you know, a, a aortic dissection either. But, you know, when somebody comes over there is, you know, three different blood pressure medications, morbidly obese, has had two heart attacks, and finally somebody, you know, a light bulb goes off and says, ah, I wonder if they have you know, sleep apnea. I mean, you know from looking at them that they're going to have an AHI of at least 80. So what is that person's risk of not getting this sleep study that allows them to get the CPAP? And can we just write for a CPAP presumptively, at, you know, et cetera? So the lab is an interesting thing. And there's an economic pressure there and a pressure to want to take care of your employees. So we're not making the 
call, but I think the answer to that would be, you know, when the Virginia Health Department says it's okay to okay to go, we'd probably do the same thing too and just be very careful that we're monitoring people and following up with them to make sure that if they get infected, they need to contact people immediately so we know. So there's gonna be a lot of a you know a tail, so to speak, I think more so than we've ever had with patients before that, okay, your interaction with me is done now, but if these things happen, we need to know so we can kind of make sure we're educated about what to do for our other patients. That's very true. Are there any other things that you've learned in the last maybe month or so dealing with all of this that could be of help to our colleagues around the country in this very quickly evolving situation? Um, I guess the things I've learned, number one, um, even though I think my office staff, my nurse practitioner, my office managers are brilliant, I think they're even more brilliant than I thought they were. So this, I, I don't know, I was always really nervous about making big changes in, in the way they would respond to them, and, you know, and, 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 and they've just been terrific in such sources of really smart ideas about things you know you should do this or we could do this kind of flow or you know the flow we started off with is clearly not what we're using right now um you know i, I think that that flexibility is, is is really key to all this and you know i saw a patient the other night at 7 p.m um and you know being at home it just doesn't seem like that big of a deal i remember watching it's probably not the right person to bring up but when I was young watching the Cosby show and I was always fascinated that he lived in a house but you never saw it but he went down these stairs and that was his clinic and I've always loved the idea of just kind of having that clinic really adjacent to where you live and it's an interesting kind of experiment to kind of go through that um, you know good and bad you may not want your dog running around while you're trying to see a patient and think about things but um, you know I think the thing we that, that we're going to struggle with next um, if I, you know, as we're kind of wrapping this up is what are we doing for our patients who are struggling to pay our bills? Um, so that's the, the new topic, uh, up for discussion within our clinic. You know, I've got a staff to support. Um, I need to be able to pay their bills so they can pay their grocery bills and their doctor bills. So, you know, it's, you know, this is the kind of thing where we're all really kind of thinking about grace periods and, and what we can do to really help our patients beyond what we do medically, but at the same time, you know, keep the lights on and take care of ourselves, our families and our patients. And so, you know, what's the appropriate amount to give and, and what's the easy way to apply that when every situation and every patient is very different. Um, so uh, that's something we're working on. And then, you know, just you know, in terms of the stimulus packages and the economic um, uh, tools and, 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 and um, programs that are out there, you know, if you're a, a sleep doctor and you own your own sleep center, and it's closed down now and you employ eight different techs and you know, I, I, I've got the luxury of going around the country and lecturing and talking to different sleep doctors and seeing how this sleep doctor does it and she does it completely differently over here and big operations and tiny little nimble operations. So I think the other thing that we're learning very quickly is, you know, what programs are available to us and, and how can we keep things going and take care of our patients even though we may be taking a hit in terms of not having sleep studies to read and process um, etc but like I said I, I think we're in really good shape right now um, so those are the kinds of things that I've been learning on the fly I think that's very helpful I, I really appreciate how you can change from the clinician hat to the patient advocate hat to the bean counter hat. I think you did that really well. Well, thank you, Dr. Winter. This has been a, a terrific conversation. This was Clinical Conversations, COVID-19, the Sleep Medicine Perspective. This is a production of the AASM Public Safety Committee. Please visit our website at aasm.org. Thank you.